Good evening and welcome to Sussex Wildlife Trust's webinar series. Tonight we are very excited to have an update on a Help Our Kelp, Kelp Forest Restoration project. Um, just a few housekeeping rules while we're here. Um, if you would like to ask a question during the presentation, um, if you go to the Q&A button on the bottom bar, you can type in your question there. Um, and hopefully we will have some time at the end of the presentation uh, to answer some of your questions. Any questions we're unable to answer tonight, we will make available um, as a blog later in the week. And this recording will also be available on the Trust's website. Um, as you may know, this has been a very exciting week for the um, Help Our Kelp project, and I will let our speakers tell you more about that in just a minute. Um, this webinar is probably the most popular one that the Wildlife Trust has put on so far, so I'm just waiting for all the attendees to file in. Uh, we're close to a thousand people um, will be watching this tonight. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Sarah Ward, who is the Living Seeds Officer at Sussex Wildlife Trust. Hi, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Hi. And Dr. Ian Hendy, who is, um, works at the University of Portsmouth and also with, the, with Blue Marine. Good evening, everyone. Delighted to be here. Excellent. Okay, I think almost everybody's in. So I'm now going to hand you over to Sarah and Ian to take you on a deep dive into the kelp forests of Sussex. Okay, we can everyone see the screen there? Are we uh, sharing the screen. Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay, so thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's just so exciting to, to see so many people um, wanting to hear about the Help Our Kelp project. And um, yeah, it's been a, a really exciting week. So Ian, if you could just flick over to the next slide, we'll just do a really brief introduction. Um, so just to introduce who, who we are, um, we'll talk more about all of the different um, partners involved in Help Our Kelp a, bit, a little bit later. Um, but myself, um, my name's Sarah Ward and I'm the Living Seas Officer at Sussex Wildlife Trust. And um, tonight I'll be co-producing, co-presenting co with Dr. Ian Hendy, um, who is the Marine Biology course leader at the University of Portsmouth and also is a scientific consultant to the Blue Marine Foundation. Um, so we'll be going through um, various aspects of kelp itself and also obviously our project. Um, but just before we actually get into um, the presentation itself, um, those of you that have perhaps been following the project for a little while have probably seen the news that we've been breaking since yesterday, which is that the Sussex IFCA's nearshore trawling bylaw is now in place and we are just ecstatic to be able to share that um, and we were able to get comment from Sir David Attenborough who um, many of you will know did narrate our original film and we are just so so pleased to be able to announce this because our project really does hang off this bylaw and it's been quite a long time in the making again those of you that have been following the project for a while know it's been sort of the best part of two years that we've been um, waiting for this bylaw to be put in place so it really is fantastic news and just really exciting that they managed to actually do it just in time for this webinar so uh, yeah fantastic news um, so just got one more slide before I hand over to you Ian if you could just click forward um, so just a little bit of information about what what the bylaw actually means um, so Essentially, it means that bottom toe trawling is now prohibited all year round within the bylaw area, um, which is highlighted on this map in pink. Um, the bylaw area does actually extend further to the east than this map shows, um, but our project area is obviously focused just on this West Sussex area. 
Um, so the larger area is four kilometers from the coastline out to sea, and then it's one kilometer um, further out towards the east. Um, this is a Sussex IFCA bylaw, so it will be policed and enforced by them. And this fisheries management um, is specifically intended to help safeguard the habitats that will ensure sustainable inshore fisheries into the future. So it really is um, a bylaw that's looking at the, the whole picture and the long term, as well as obviously um, the instant effects that bottom toe trawling would have. And incidentally, it also does encompass the Selsey Bill and the Hounds Marine Conservation Zone. Um, so it's really great that that newly designated zone has already got protection being afforded to it. Um, it's a very special area, um, lots of marine biodiversity there. So really fantastic, it's being protected. Um, so that's, that's just our really exciting news. And obviously we'll talk a little bit more um, about what that means for the project further, further on. Um, but now I'm gonna hand back over to Ian, who's going to talk more about kelp itself. So thank you very much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. So good evening, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to be here tonight and overwhelmed the fact that there's almost a thousand people watching this and tuning in tonight. So super excited that there's also loads of other fellow kelp lovers out there. So as already mentioned, my name's Ian Hendy. So essentially, I'm a tropical marine ecologist. So I study things like mangrove forests, coral reefs and seagrass beds. And my research spans Indonesia to Mexico and also the UK. But in the UK, I study cold water environments. So I focus on seagrass habitats. I focus on salt marshes. But more importantly, I focus on kelp forests. In actual fact, kelp forests are one of my favourite ecosystems. And, and, uh, and hopefully you guys are going to learn why in the next 20 or 30 minutes or so. So by means of an overview, we're gonna be talking about kelp and the structure and function of a kelp forest and what kelp can do to our local environment and how it can benefit our local environment. We're gonna be talking about the kelp structure as well. So how kelp is formed. So you can see these images here of this wonderful kelp forest, these underwater vibrant forests looking at the canopy at the surface, extending all the way down to the seabed. So we're going to be talking about the features of a kelp forest. Then we're going to be looking at the ecology of kelp. So not only we'll be looking at the seaweeds themselves, but also the associated biodiversity. So how important kelp forests are for commercial fisheries and for the local biodiversity in general. Then we're going to be looking at the impacts. So I won't dwell on this too much, but we're gonna be focusing on things like climate change, sediment dumping, all of these things that affect kelp restoration. But I'm not going to leave you with ecological grief. We're gonna focus on really big positives at the end of this because of this Help Our Kelp project that myself and of course, Sarah, my colleague that we're working on together, trying to restore kelp on your local doorstep in Sussex. So this will be the Help Our Kelp project. So what is kelp? Let's think about the laminaria, which are the group of the macro algae. So these are the big seaweeds. Now, these are what we call habitat forming seaweeds. So they provide structure and cover for lots of vulnerable and juvenile species, such as fish and invertebrates. So we'll talk about that later, but they belong to what we call the firefighter, a group of macro algae that really do establish complex communities around our UK coastline. So they're very important. Now, in actual fact, in Europe, what we see are 14 species of kelp species. Now, in the UK, we have 50% of those species. So it's very biologically diverse. This is because what do we see usually? High wave energy environments, rocky shoreline so it's a perfect environment for kelp to survive in because kelp prefer rocky substrata rather than mud so you see lots of kelp in rocky environments particularly in Devon in Cornwall and along the Sussex coastline and particularly around the Isle of Wight as well and the coast of Wales and Scotland you see lots of kelp forests rich and vibrant kelp forests they form underwater forests so if you look at this image here so extending up to the canopy where the sunlight is at its maximum, you see the fronds of the kelp, which are the leaf-like structures absorbing the UV light, the CO2, drawing down that carbon from the atmosphere. 
Then, of course, what you can see is through the structural complexity of the kelp is the biodiversity of what we call the nursery function. And we'll talk about that later as well, in actual fact. As I said, they form in rocky areas. Now, I also focus on seagrass habitats and salt marsh ecosystems. Now, those ecosystems are very different to kelp forests. Although they all photosynthesize and draw down carbon from the atmosphere, CO2, so atmospheric gases and greenhouse gases, they establish roots within the muddy systems which salt marsh and seagrass will be found in. But kelp forests, they don't have that ability because they establish on rocks. So they have a different ecology, which we'll talk about and touch upon that later. Now, of course, like seagrass habitats, kelp forests will grow in shallow oceans. This is because of the UV light and light intensity traveling through the water to enable the energy for the kelp to capture and absorb that UV light and transform it into carbohydrate. So that's what they do. And what they do with that carbohydrate, what do they do with that energy? They produce it into tissues. So as you can see, all of this vegetative matter, this is all born from photosynthesis and lots of this organic matter then goes to adjacent ecosystem with that energy feeding other habitats. And again, we'll put that into context later. They're what we call ecosystem engineers. So what do we mean by that? So they reduce impacts from climate change. So they reduce greenhouse gases. They purify the coastal waters with oxygenation. So they oxygenate the water. They reduce ocean acidification, but they provide habitat for many juvenile species. That's the important factor. So they can improve coastal fisheries. So they're very important key species for our coastal habitats in the UK. So let's look at the kelp life cycle. So let's look about this. And so we'll go very briefly on this and we we'll do a very sort of general basic overview. So what happens is the adult kelp, which is known as a sporophyte, let's call it an adult kelp, after about two years from being juvenile, when they're adult, when they mature, they release their zoospores, okay? So they're male and female gametophytes, which are the male and female sperm and eggs, okay? So what happens is when they're released in the water column, fertilization will occur. After the male and female zoospites will fertilize each other, then of course, what happens is you get a baby kelp growing, then they'll settle on the rocks. Now, the greater the density of the male and female uh, kelp eggs in the water, the greater the chance of success of a thriving kelp forest. But of course, that's dependent upon available habitat and the structure for the kelp to settle on in these rocky environments. You see in this image here on the left, you see this bare rock here, that would be ideal habitat for kelp to settle on. So in Sussex and everyone, what we see are three key species of kelp. Now they form a zonation pattern determined by the depth of water and the availability of sunlight. So what are those species? So let's take a quick look at those. So the first species we see are Laminaria hyperborea, or otherwise known as tangleweed. So if you can see in this image here, you can see why it's called tangleweed. You see it's very complex. And these are the leaf-like structures called the fronds, which absorb all the UV light. So that able, that keeps it able, enables it to photosynthesize. So if you look in this image here on the right, okay, you see these leaf-like projections. Those are the fronds, okay? So that enables Laminaria hyperborea to photosynthesize. And what I'm showing you here, highlighted with the laser pointer, is what we call the stipe. It's a bit like the tree trunk. So that's what keeps the kelp seaweed upright, okay? Then below here, we have what we call a hold fast. And I'm gonna explain what that means later. So a little bit about the distribution of Laminaria hyperborea. It's found at depths of 10 to 30 meters where the UV light can penetrate in clear water. Now, because it's in deep water, it needs to have quite a stiff stipe to keep it upright. Now, these seaweeds reach in excess of about nine feet in length. And in actual fact, they can reach densities of about 20 individuals per square meter. So in actual fact, they can produce very densely packed underwater forests. So if you think about all of those individual seaweeds very closely packed together, that's a great habitat if you're a juvenile or vulnerable organism 
to avoid predation because it reduces predator prey interactions. The second species that we have, Laminaria digitata. Now, you could be forgiven that this is exactly the same species, but what you can see is that the, the, uh, the, the fronds here are slightly broader in size and it's a darker color. Now, they still have the same finger-like projections for the fronds, but the stipe is much longer for Laminaria digitata or otherwise known as orweed. And we're gonna tell you why that is, okay? So morphological differences will suit its habitat. Now, if you think back, I talked, I mentioned about the fact that we have zonation patterns. So Laminaria hyperborea or tangleweed is found at 10 to 30 meters, but Laminaria digitata is found fringing 10 meter depth where Laminaria hyperborea is found. But these species, Laminaria digitata, can be found all the way up to the low tide mark. And the reason why you see this long stipe is because it's very leathery and very flexible, unlike the other species, Laminaria hyperborea, because, because it's flexible, if you think about it, in the shallower water, the wave energy is much greater. So these species get thrown about much more than they would do in deeper water. So they have to be very flexible because if they weren't, what would happen is that these species would simply get broken off the rocks and get washed away. Now, again, similar to the other species, these species can be up to between uh, six to nine feet in length. So again, forming big densities and strong densities of about 20 individuals per meter squared. So pr proving and providing great habitat complexity for lots of juvenile vulnerable organisms. Then our third species, last but not least, Saccharina latissima, or otherwise known as sugar kelp. Now, as you can see, completely different in its morphology or its shape. So unlike the finger-like projections of the fronds of Laminaria hyperborea or Laminaria digitata, it's one big frond. Now this actually helps its distribution because this species is what we call more of a generalist, okay? So this is a very large leaf-like structure, very broad. So this enables this species to live in low light conditions. So it's very opportunistic and generalist in its distribution. So we find this species in inlets and bays, but also, but not as common as the other two species that we talked about, but it can be found in areas where Laminaria digitata are found and Laminaria hyperborea are found, but it's more common in low wave energy environments where it's more turbid, which means it's darker and less sunlight can penetrate. This is because this seaweed can actually maximize its photosynthetic, so photosynthetic ability to absorb more light because of its broad frond. Now, these guys can reach up to nine feet in length and again, creating huge and really packed densities of up to about 20 individuals per square meter. So again, really important for its habitat structure. Now let's think about the structure of kelp itself. So you've heard me talk about these aspects of salt for the holdfast, for example. Now, we mentioned salt marsh and seagrass. Now, salt marsh and seagrass will grow in soft sediment environments. They will establish their roots in the mud. But of course, because it's a kelp forest and it's born on a rocky substrata, they don't have root structures and they don't have muddy environments. So what happens is, they form these hole fasts that actually anchor themselves to the rocks. And it's really strong and they're very powerful because if you think about it with a high wave energy environment, they have to anchor themselves. And they're very good job at doing that and sticking to those environments. The kelp stipe, of course, is very leathery to the touch and it's very strong. And again, this attaches the kelp to the substrata of the rocks. And of course, the fronds or the leaf-like structures, you can see they're up in the canopy towards the sunlight absorbing all of the UV light, converting that photosynthesis into carbohydrate. So there we go, you see the fronds there photosynthesizing for the leaf-like fronds. So the kelp ecology then, so let's think about its habitat and the ecosystem. So some, some numbers for you guys. So kelp can grow between 20 to 30 times faster than terrestrial plants. So in the UK, in actual fact, you can get about 10 to 20 centimeters of growth in kelp in an ideal environment per month. 
So if you think about the CO2 in the atmosphere, when the cowper are photosynthesizing, what they're doing is using UV light, oxygen and air and water and converting that into carbohydrate. That carbohydrate then gets processed into the tissues of the kelp from the fronds to the stipe to the hold fast. That's what we call productivity. So the amount of energy stored within the biomass of the kelp forest. They absorb the CO2 in the water around them. Now, this is really important. Now, I'm happy to go into the chemistry of this, but I don't want to bore all of you. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the actual water chemistry of this, but the take home message is what this means is because they're absorbing CO2, it means they're reducing localized ocean acidification. So in other words, they actually mitigate impacts from climate change. So not only are kelp reducing CO2 from the atmosphere as very effective carbon sponges, but they're also reducing ocean acidification in localized areas. Now, this is really important, of course. Kelp will oxygenate the water. Now, remember what I told you about the nursery function. Now, if you're a juvenile fish species, if you're a juvenile invertebrate, and you're developing, you need to have really good water quality because the greater the oxygen availability, the greater amount of energy you can put into growth and getting bigger and getting stronger. Okay, so this is really important for a healthy environment. Kelp will reduce wave energy up to 70%. This reduces coastal erosion. So again, mitigating storm damage okay so for shoreline management plans for example for natural sea defenses this is really important this is what we call an ecosystem service okay so this is really important it has lots of value to that so we have mitigation for climate change reducing greenhouse gases improving fishery biomass for commercial fish stocks and improving natural storm defenses coupled with seagrass and salt marsh by the way if you have those three they create a very good storm defense and of course a massive carbon sink as well. So that's a very important and it's that's a huge economic value. They have food provisioning as well for commercial fisheries. And in fact, kelp will have a significant nursery function. For example, cod, juvenile cod will utilize kelp forests. Also bass, bream, cuttlefish, lobsters, lots of juvenile organisms for commercial fisheries will dwell in the safety of the complexity of a kelp forest. Of course, they spend their juvenile life stages in the kelp forest. When they develop into adults, they then venture out to the wider ocean where the other fishermen and stakeholders can get the benefit from called spillover. Kelp, so we have a carbon conveyor. So what do I mean by that? So let's talk about that in layman's terms. So again, I'm going to revert back to salt marsh and sea grasses, okay? They photosynthesize, they draw down the carbon. That carbon then gets sequestered into the blades of the sea grass, okay, or in the salt marsh. Then lots of that organic matter gets retained within the mud, creating what we call a carbon sink. So the carbon is retained in situ within those ecosystems, but kelp doesn't have that ability. So what kelp does very efficiently, by the way, is a carbon sponge, absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, these greenhouse gases, transforms the carbohydrate into its tissues from, from the fronds to the stipe to, to the hold fast. Then what happens is after it breaks off and degrades, lots of that organic matter will then travel down to deeper waters where there's a huge carbon stock of kelp derived carbon. So it's a carbon conveyor. So it transports the carbon elsewhere. Kelp contributes to almost 50% of the total primary production around our UK coastlines. What does that mean? So if you think about our coastal fisheries, which we all depend upon for, for fishing, for example, and, and subsidence for, for commercial fish stocks, almost 50% of the, of the ecosystems around our UK coastlines are dependent upon the energy derived from kelp forests. So they're super vital. More than 80% of kelp carbon or the kelp production, so the carbon within kelp enters the carbon cycle, either as detritus or dissolved organic matter. 
So in other words, what this means is as I was talking about the carbon conveyor here, as you can see in my laser pointer, much of the carbon ends up in deeper water as a big kelp derived carbon sink. So it's quite huge and significant in actual fact. Up to 85% reduction in storm waves over a distance of 250 meters. So if you think about standing on the shoreline and extend out to 250 meters and you're in a storm and you've got a kelp frost between you and the storm, by the time that storm wave hits you, it's 85% less strength. So of course, this has great implications for reducing impacts on movement of sand and stones or shoreline drift, for example. So that's really important, again, for shoreline management plans. So let's put this into context then everyone. So we talk about salt marsh and we know there's a, we know there's a, a, a carbon store within salt marshes of about 80 tonnes of carbon per hectare. So one hectare is about the size of a football pitch. So salt marsh can store about 80 tonnes of carbon. Seagrass, in actual fact, can store anywhere from 100 to 140 tonnes of carbon per hectare or the size of a football pitch, anywhere in between that. A kelp forest, as you now know, cannot store carbon within the sediments, so it has a modest 10 to 30 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year. So it's very efficient at drawing down carbon. But remember, lots of that carbon gets deposited elsewhere in the deeper oceans. But to put this into co to context, if we were to restore one football sized, one football pitch sized area of salt marsh, seagrass and kelp, that's the equivalent of driving a car around the world 32 times in terms of emissions of CO2. So it's staggering, isn't it? If you think about the amount of carbon saved. So if you extrapolate that up to a square kilometer, then to many square kilometers of salt marsh, seagrass and kelp, think of the amount of carbon saved that would otherwise be in the atmosphere. Think of the nursery function with the amount of commercial fish production that could be produced with these ecosystems. So significant in actual fact. So here are some stats here. So these are what we call ecosystem services. As you remember, I mentioned that a few slides back and it has a value. OK, so we're losing our natural coastal habitats very rapidly in actual fact. And this is through habitat fragmentation, climate change, lots of different reasons. And this is costing the UK and globally huge amounts of money. Now, globally, by the year 2050, 30 years from now, we're going to have a bill of about eight trillion pounds through loss of our natural ecosystem services. So, of course, with climate change ensuing and increasing, increasing storm damage for inadequate storm defences, reductions in food biomass and productivity has a massive cost incurred to that globally. So we need to act now. So what are the impacts to kelp forests then? So we have low, there's lots of different impacts, chief among which global warming. So kelp are cold water species. And what do we see? Oceans are starting to increase in temperature. Now, is, remember that schematic that I showed you of the, of the kelp sporophytes and the kelp uh, uh, sperm and eggs fertilization and that cycle, and they won't settle in warmer water. So global warming is an impact. Habitat destruction, dredging, sediment dumping is a, has a big impact on kelp because it changes the ecosystem. Coastal development, has a massive impact. All these impacts will create what we call a phase shift. So this means it goes from a steady state ecosystem going to an unstable state ecosystem. So it becomes an unfavorable habitat. So what we're doing as scientists is to get the habitat back to an area to a time when kelp will thrive again. So the water quality improves, the turbidity improves, and so kelp will grow back and so we can provide habitat to change from a steady state from an unsteady state. Okay, so that's what we want to do. And I just put this graph up here, as you can see on, on, on the y axis here, which is CO2 concentration, so carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere. Okay, now I just want to draw your attention, everyone, to this rectangle in the red here. So this IPCC means the International Panel for Climate Change. 
This is a conference of politicians and scientists. They get together and they report on the latest stats and information of climate change impacts to the world. Then what the politicians are supposed to do with that information is disseminate that to change at policy level. So we stop becoming a carbon emitting society to becoming a carbon absorbing society. So let me walk you through this. So we've got the first one in 1990. The second one, as you can see that I'm highlighting in 2000, the third one in 2010 and so on. But what do you see with this line in actual fact? There's actually an exponential increase in carbon dioxide emissions in our atmosphere, even with the knowledge that we've gained over the years. So in actual fact, we're not listening to the science, but yet still, we're suffering the impacts from climate change and having these huge bills that we have to we have to pay out for because of our loss of ecosystem services. So globally, what are we seeing then because of those impacts? In Canada, 90% of kelp has gone in the last 40 years, 90%. In Norway, in 20 years, the last 20 years, They've lost 80% of their kelp forests, all due to the things that we've been talking about with coastal development and climate change and such things. In the UK, if we carry on at the same rate of loss, within the next 80 years, we will have lost all of our kelp forests. So in other words, on average, we're losing about 300 square miles of kelp per year. And this is all due to the impacts that we've been talking about now. With a loss of kelp comes an associated loss of biodiversity of up to 90%. Now remember a few slides back when we talked about the almost 50% of the primary production of other ecosystems around our UK coast are dependent upon kelp energy. So think about if we lose all of our kelp forests and what that's going to do to the associated biodiversity. And of course, on the flip side of that, on the positive side, if we increase the kelp, that's only going to increase the biodiversity by almost 90% of the commercial fisheries that we talked about. So here are some stats on here just showing you that if we count at the same rate of loss, the UK will have zero kelp forest left. Now again, guys, I don't want to instill ecological grief with you all, okay? That's not what we're here to do because there are massive positives now, okay? So this, this actually is a win for us. It's a win for the ecology, win for the environment, and again, a win for the economy and the people that depend upon the coastal oceans. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague now, Sarah, who's gonna to talk to you about the project that we've all been working on called the Help Our Kelp Project. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing the screen because I have control of it at the minute, then Sarah's gonna take control, then she can walk you through the Help Our Kelp project. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so thank you so much to Ian um, for the introduction to, to kelp itself. And um, what I'm going to do now is talk to you about kelp in the context of our project here in Sussex. Um, so just picking up a little bit on um, the slight doom and gloom aspect that Ian finished on there, which <laughs> unfortunately is, you know, it is the reality. Um, before I actually start about uh, talking about our project, um, I thought I'd just really quickly perhaps anticipate questions that I know people will be wanting to ask. And it's something that I always get asked no matter what I'm presenting on, um, which is what you can do to help. Um, in terms of the, the, you know, the issue we're seeing here with loss of kelp, with um, the, the associated issues of uh, climate change and carbon. And one of the most important things I think you actually can do is support initiatives like this. Um, because of course there are things that you can do as an individual um, to keep check and in terms of like your emissions, how much you use your car, that kind of thing, which is fantastic and every little helps. But um, when we have these opportunities to do larger scale things like this, um, particularly when it's formed through um, non-government organisations, having the support of the general public behind us is absolutely vital to help us drive things forward. And the fact that there are so many of you here tonight is really, really fantastic. And um, thank you so much for your support. Um, so I'm going to 
just flick through now. Hopefully things will, oh, it's not actually letting me go forward. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm conscious that there probably are a few people here that are perhaps not from the Sussex area. So just to give you a little bit of geography as to exactly where we're talking about here, um, we're on the West Sussex coast, so as you can see here is Sussex here, so London up here, and specifically we're looking at the area between um, Selsey Bill, which is this little jutting out piece of land here, and um, Shoreham by Sea, which is approximately here. So um, in terms of a little bit of historical background, the reason that we're actually looking at restoration here is because historically along this stretch of coastline, it was, um, kelp was abundant. And as you can see from this map here, it illustrates where the kelp used to be back in sort of the 1980s. Um, and unfortunately over time, that kelp forest has massively diminished. Um, and you can see in the second map here, um, the extent of what, what it is now. And in reality, if you actually, um, you know, go and scuba dive or even have a look on the shoreline at very low tide, it literally is just one or two individual kelp, uh, kelp individuals that you'll see sort of floating around. They're not by any means, um, you know, a, a, a forest like what you've been seeing in the pictures that Ian has been showing. It is literally just one or two individuals. Um, at, you know, very sporadic along the coastline. So it's it's quite a sad state of affairs compared to what it was, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And what's sad about it is that it's happened very slowly and it's happened, um, you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind, as, you know, a lot of marine conservation matters um, that does happen because it's just sort of below the area um, that we can actually see on a regular basis. Um, so the reason for that decline, I mean, there's there's a whole load of reasons that it can be attributed to, um, one of which is um, the change in fishing practices. So over that time period, there was um, an increase in the amount of bottom toe trawling. Um, so essentially what that is, is, is fishers dragging quite heavy gear along the, um, the bottom of the sea. And of course, it's, it's quite non-selective. It does just drag along the bottom of the sea and will take anything out in its wake. So things like kelps, which you know, although Ian was obviously explaining that they're quite sturdy, they, they just get dragged across and, um, and, and that's it, they're taken away. And of course, with this repetition of that kind of activity, it doesn't ever get the chance to, to regrow. Um, and of course, there are other, other factors at play here. We're, we're living in um, a changing climate. So of course, the change in sea temperature and associated changes with that will have had an effect as well. Um, and things like sedimentation, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, storms as well. So um, the great storm of 1988 will have um, caused a lot of damage to, um, to the environment there under the sea um, and other storm events that have happened throughout the years. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we have um, what is now not a proposed trawling exclusion zone. It is a trawling exclusion zone, which is fantastic news. And this is really what um, our, it's going to be the principal mechanism for the restoration project, um, this new bylaw. And what that's essentially going to do is take away that, that pressure um, on the environment that the fishing was having. And by taking away that pressure, it allows the kelp a little bit of breathing room to, to hopefully re-establish on its own over a, a period of perhaps a few years. We're, we're going to see, see how things turn out um, over the course of the next few years. Um, so thinking about actually who's involved, um, as I mentioned right back at the beginning, there's quite a lot of, of organisations involved. Um, the Sussex IFCA have been absolutely fundamental to getting this project off the ground. Um, it's their bylaw that's, that's in place and that essentially this project is kind of hanging off. Um, and then there's a, a load of organisations that we're calling ourselves the Help Our Kelp Partnership. And that includes the Marine Conservation Society, um, Blue Marine Foundation, Ian at the University of Portsmouth, and of course Sussex Wildlife Trust, and then Big Wave Productions, who um, were the force behind that fantastic film that hopefully most of you will have seen, which was narrated by Sir David Attenborough. And since we've been um, working in partnership together, we've also been developing things with a, very, a whole load of other um, outside organisations who have been interested in helping the project along the way. 
And we now have what we're calling a strategic stakeholder group and a science group. And um, I'll go on to um, speak a little bit more about what those groups have been up to um, a little bit further down in the presentation. Um, Ian mentioned a whole load of the benefits associated with, with kelp. So I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail here, but this is essentially why we are pushing this um, restoration project, why we want to be involved. Um, so all of the things that Ian has been talking about, about vital nursery grounds, the crucial habitat, kelp being um, productive and diverse ecosystem. Just think of all of that in a local context, and that is essentially why we're doing this project. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if Ian mentioned the term nature-based solutions, but um, that's one of the sort of terms that we use. So thinking about using nature to help us with um, problems associated with our modern way of living and climate change. And this project really does have a whole load of fantastic benefits associated with it. And so Ian talked a bit about blue carbon. It's, it comes with um, quite a lot of caveats and question marks um, in the context of Sussex here. And so, of course, Ian was saying about um, the kelp going into the deep oceans and storing the carbon that way. And um, there has been a lot of interest in the, the blue carbon around this project. And um, of course, we're not, we're not trying to say, no, there's, there's no blue carbon associated with it at all. Um, but it's, um, we're making sure you know, that it, the understanding is that it's, it's more about um, the conveyor belt mechanism that Ian talked about rather than sequestering and storing carbon in the same manner that, for example, the, the salt marshes do, um, as Ian mentioned. And um, so at, the kelp is acting as a conduit for carbon or um, a carbon conveyor belt, I quite like that term. Um, so the detail of this narrative in Sussex is currently being explored um, by Portsmouth University and Sussex University. And of course, so while studies do suggest that the macroalgae or kelp has, has potential to sequester large amounts of carbon, in the context of the English Channel, which is not deep water, it's, it's quite, sh um, quite shallow comparatively. It's not yet clear, but we really hope to um, keep exploring this as the restoration project gets underway and you know, understand this better. And um, that will all be being developed as the project gets further down the line. Um, what we are thinking about quite a lot is, um, like I said, the climate change adaptation, those nature-based solutions um, of the restoration. So this includes things like increasing the resilience of the local ecosystem to external stresses. So when we're thinking about having increased biodiversity and biomass, that, that is one of the things that increases the resilience of, uh, of the ecosystem. So when there are things like storm events um, or changes in temperature, that kind of thing, the ecosystem can, can handle it a little bit more. Um, we also have oxygenation of the local water. So of course Ian's been talking about um, the sort of biology factor of, of what kelp can do. Um, it takes in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. So oxygenating the local water around the kelp forest. Um, and also he mentioned about protection against coastal flooding and erosion, which um, again, it's a, it's a really interesting um, process that can happen through having kelp there and and it's actually being looked into by um, local councils to see how that can benefit um, you know their their um, plans for, uh, for coastline defense and that kind of thing so in terms of where we are now um, it's been a real journey to get to this point and actually we are just at the very beginning and it's it's so exciting so um when I was putting this presentation together, I was sort of holding off on um, trying, to, trying to put everything together because I thought, oh, is, is this bylaw going to get signed up in time? And of course it did. And this infographic is now out of date. So hopefully I haven't totally butchered the look of this infographic by just putting a little tick there and um, the date of which the bylaw got signed off, which of course was yesterday. Um, so as you can see, just from this timeline, um, it's been in the making since June 2018. So we're actually pushing on three years since the very beginning of when the um, bylaw was first being put into place. Um, it's just fantastic that it's it's gone through now. And of course, we can now move on to this, this part here, which is um, really just a case of 
getting our projects properly off the ground and um, seeing, seeing where we go from here. So what are we actually up to? What have we been up to over the past few months whilst we've been waiting for that bylaw? We've been preparing things so that we can hit the ground running, which is what we're intending to do over the next few weeks and months. We've been consolidating everything that um, all of our various organisations have been trying to bring together. And we've also been seeking funds because this is not actually um, a fully funded project as yet. In terms of preparation, as I mentioned, we've um, put together our strategic stakeholder group, which um, is, is a really exciting group formed up of all of these, what we're calling strategic stakeholders. So all various organizations that have got some kind of role to play, not necessarily actively in terms of our actual restoration project, but helping us get through potential boundaries and getting the message out there to the wider public. Um, we also have a science group. We've had two meetings with our science group so far, and it's encompassing, of course, all of the ecological and biological aspects of a kelp restoration, but also thinking about some of the more physical factors, oceanographic factors, and also social sciences, which is, um, is really nice to be able to think about what this means for local people, local communities, um, other stakeholders like, like fisheries. And so consolidating the work, um, there's a huge amount of data um, that we're looking at, sort of historical data, anecdotal data, um, all different manner of reports and things. And what we actually are trying to do is bring all that together to make some sense out of it and give ourselves a baseline to work from so that we know exactly where it is that we're starting from and that we can then push our project forward and work out exactly where we need to go from here. Um, this project has been. Um, it, there's just been so much interest and so many different organizations wanting to get involved so um, managing all of those different partners that want to be involved is, is no mean feat um, so the partnership is obviously trying its best to to make sure that we're driving everyone forward in the same direction and making sure we're doing that you know holding each other's hands as much as possible and of course dovetailing with other existing projects as well so um, you can see here wonderful sea search volunteer so i'm sure there's some um, some sea search volunteers in the audience tonight and we will be uh, using sea search as a mechanism for some of our research um, and of course our world coast sussex project which you can read about on our website and a whole manner of other projects that are and research, research streams that are already in place as well And so, as I mentioned, we're, the project isn't actually fully funded. We have got um, some funding already covering certain aspects of the project. Um, but because there's so many different aspects of the project, um, things are cropping up all the time that we think, actually, this is an interesting area of research. We'd like to get that funded. Um, so we're working with key strategic collaborators. Um, all of those organizations that were mentioned in the previous slide. I'm not necessarily saying that they're all people that are going to be giving money to this project, but it's just about working with as many people as possible and making sure that we've got funding to cover what needs to be done. Of course, applying for external funding and um, using resources that are already available to us through the people that are working on this project. Um, so in terms of establishing a baseline, um, as I mentioned, there is a whole load of um, data available to us through projects and research, research streams that have already been happening. So what we need to do is make sure that we re are reviewing all of that data, bringing it together into something that makes sense and looking at where, OK, we've we've got all of this data, but what are we missing? What do we still need to know? What do we need to understand? And that will help us develop um, the monitoring that needs to be done over the course of the next few years now that the bylaw is in place and now that the pressure from trawling has been taken away. We also need to better understand the environment. So by developing that monitoring and keep on looking at, at what's happening, where the changes are occurring, we're then going to be analysing the data that's going to be continually coming in through those different streams of research. And the most important thing over the course of the next, well, I'm not even sure how long, it's just to give it some time. We may end up with um, a situation where the kelp just restores itself naturally because that big pressure of trawling has been taken away. But there is a scenario as well where we end up that the kelp, there's other factors at play here and the kelp isn't able to restore itself naturally. 
in which case we might be looking at an assisted restoration. And that is one of the streams of research that we will be looking into over the course of the next couple of years, should it be that we need to go down that route. So our future plans um, is, at, it's just a massive, massive wide ranging project. Um, so of course there's the actual restoration itself and all of the data and evidence that's going to be being gathered as part of that. But we're also hoping to, to do some much wider engagement to really tell the story about this. It, it's already been a project that has been so engaging for the wider public and it's just been so exciting to, to see how engaged everybody is with this project. And um, we want to make it um, a restoration project that local communities can feel really proud of and feel that it's part of their local community and part of what their local coastline you know, is all about. Um, and of course that entails working with a huge variety of different stakeholders. And we really, really want to make sure that all the different stakeholders are engaged with driving this project forward. And what that means realistically is that we then have um, evidence in place to uphold that bylaw. It's not 100% guaranteed that that bylaw will be in place forever, but we, we want it to be, we need it to be. So all of this information will be um, making sure if it ever does get challenged in the future, that we have the evidence to, to say, no, it's necessary and we need to keep it in place. Um, we may be able to inform future policies and fisheries management at a local or more national level. And we may also be able to act as, as a bit of a blueprint for other um, restoration projects of a similar nature. Um, as I mentioned, create that sense of local ownership and make people proud that this is on their doorstep. And then, um, of course, what we were talking about in terms of um, the nursery grounds for local fisheries, it, it, it should be able to help Sussex towards um, more sustainable fisheries in our local area as well. And so hopefully over the course of the next few years, we can go from looking like this, which is sadly what it, it does look like at the moment, to something a little bit more like this, which I'm sure you can agree is, um, is really something that would be incredibly special on our Sussex coastline. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I really hope that you've um, enjoyed our presentation tonight. Um, and thank you to all of you who have supported the process so far. We really couldn't have done this without the huge level of public support um, for the project and for the bylaw. So thank you ever so much um, for engaging with our project. Um, we're going to hopefully have some time for questions now. Um, but just before I hand back over to Richard to... Um, to look at the questions. I just wanted to say that we are going to be following up this webinar with um, some further webinars that are going to be specifically for our Sea Search volunteers or anybody that particularly wants to engage more with the data collection, science and research side of things. Um, so again, this will be being led by Ian and myself and we haven't put dates in the diary for this yet, but do keep an eye out on our social media and um, those that are engaged with Sea Search will be emailing you all to see if you want to participate in that. Um, and of course, I will be organizing some dives over the summer, which will be specifically looking at our kelp habitats. And I really hope to see some of you lovely volunteers there. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ian. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I certainly learnt a lot about, about kelp. Now, we've had close to 100 questions, um, so we aren't gonna have time for all of those tonight. So I thought um, in the next 10 minutes or so, if I can ask a couple along general themes, I will um, see how far we can go. Um, we've had one from six-year-old Isabella, uh, who's very, likes the idea that kelp protects sea creatures. Um, and along with some other people, she's wondered, can they do anything such as plant kelp or can we seed kelp um, if it doesn't seed on its own? Is that something the project will be covering? So um, it's, as Sarah's already intimated, there's gonna be two kind of parallel prongs that we're gonna be looking at now. To answer that question in basic terms, we're gonna be doing what we call active restoration and passive restoration. So there are already pockets of kelp that are still thriving. So yes, there's some successes. Now, those pockets of kelp, 
that are mature kelp are releasing the kelp seeds, if you will, into the water. And where there's available hard habitat, things like rocks and things like wooden structures or anything under the water, the kelp will settle on, the baby kelp will settle on and grow. So it would do it naturally. Now, that, that's what we call natural restoration, but we will also be employing what we call active restoration, which is where we have to have a little bit of an interaction with the environment. And so what that means is, for example, preceding things like rocks or even ropes that will have kelp growing on them. So when you immerse them in the water, they'll release more eggs into the water, more seeds in the water to help the kelp regrow back. So it's natural restoration that will happen in areas where there's already kelp forest, then areas that we can actually give it a helping hand by adding some rocks or habitat in there where the kelp can grow onto. So we'll be doing a bit of both. Fantastic. Um, we've had a couple of questions as well about uh, how rivers relate to um, the kelp forest um, in terms of does uh, runoff from rivers um, and does sewage contamination um, affect how the kelp forest may, may develop? So, so sedimentation will impact kelp in the way that it makes the water more murky. Okay, so if you're reducing the light availability in water, then that reduces the ability to kelp to grow, for example. But we do have three species, of course, in Sussex. One of those species, uh, the local name sugar kelp or Saccharina latissima prefers low light conditions. So what we're expecting in those areas is sugar kelp to grow quite rapidly. Now, the beauty of kelp is that it does what we call bioremediates the water. So anything like nitrates or phosphates that go in the water to a certain level, kelp will absorb those nutrients so it purifies the water so it acts like a natural filter for example so it actually improves the water quality for example um, uh, you see some areas where where we have fish farms and you see it in scotland you see it elsewhere around the world and in actual fact what those fish farmers do is actually have kelp farms next to them to absorb lots of the nutrients that come from those fish farms, fish farms to reduce the impacts of what we call eutrophication, which is pollution of those nutrients because the kelp absorb it very well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've had quite a few questions about um, the fishing boats themselves. Um, Jamie has asked, how do the trawlers know when they're in the area where they can trawl and where they can't trawl? Okay, so um, like I mentioned um, earlier, the bylaw has been put in place by the Sussex IFCA and it's their bylaw to make sure that it gets um, properly policed. But what they do to, to all boat users is make sure that they're issued with coordinates as to where that, um, that new bylaw is. Because obviously it's not like when we're on the land and you suddenly come across a nature reserve that has got a gate on it and a sign that says you're now in a nature reserve, please don't do X, Y, Z. It's not so clear cut in the sea. So of course most boats these days will have um, a GPS system on it that will have, you know, sort of a map of some description that will allow the boat to tell exactly where they are in the water. And that will then, they will then get um, you know, a little piece of software to put into that map to tell them where the boundary of that protected area is. And they will obviously have supplementary information provided to them, which will tell them what they are and are not allowed to do within that area. And obviously it's up to them to make sure that they're, um, you know, not doing anything wrong. And the Sussex IFCA will be, will be there to ensure that, um, yeah, that all the people that are using that area are indeed now using it to um, to uphold the bylaw. Brilliant. Um, in a related question, um, how has the project um, approached working with um, fishermen and um, hopefully getting them involved in the in the process and supportive of the project? So throughout the bylaw process, it is, um, it's a public consultation as a lot of people will be aware because they participated in it and 
of course, that, that is the Sussex IFCA's um, job to make sure that it does get pushed out to all of the relevant people who want to have a say in it. So absolutely, from that perspective, um, the fishermen have already sort of engaged with this project because of the opportunity afforded to them to engage in the consultation process. Um, but what we're wanting to do now that the project um, itself is able to get underway is more actively involve them in um, how we push things forward. And we're working with the Blue Mar Marine Foundation who have done um, a really fantastic project um, down in Lyme Regis, which I think probably Ian is actually better placed to talk about than I am because he's been involved in that. So if I hand over to you, Ian, you can give a bit more info on that. Absolutely. I raised my hand there as well, just to go, I, I can talk about this. Yeah, yeah. So I thank you, Sarah. So as, as, as Sarah's already intimated, um, I also wear a, a Blue Marine Foundation hat. I, I, uh, so I'm a principal lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, but I consult for the Blue Marine Foundation and I help run a sustainable fishery in Lyme Bay. Now, what happened was about 15 years ago, the fishermen there, a group of fishermen, there's about 30 of them now, wanted to stop trawling, so mobile fishing, because they saw, they saw the, the actual value in the local reefs there. So what happened was after they stopped trawling and they only used static fishing gear methods. So things like pots, lobster pots that aren't, drag, uh, aren't dra uh, dragged along the seabed. So they remain on the seabed static or static nets. Now what happened was after a certain amount of years, the seabed habitat started to regrow. Now, of course, as you now know with kelp, because of the habitat complexity, with the reefs in Lyme Bay, what happened was it generated the habitat complexity that came back. And with it came back the nursery function, they came back to the, the baby fish and the biomass of fish. So the latest stats that we have from the research that we're doing with the monitoring of those fisheries is that the fishermen have an increased income of anywhere between 20 and 50% increase in income. They're fishing, with 50% less effort, and they're catching two and a half times more lobsters than they used to. They're catching four times more fish than they used to. And in actual fact, there's four times more the biomass of the fisheries in the local waters. So it's a tremendous win for not only for the biomass and for the environment and for the ecology, but it's also a win for the fishermen because now they're earning more but fishing with less effort. So they're happier. And so what we want to do in actual fact is have an exchange where we want to invite fishermen from Sussex waters all along that coast there to come over to Lime Bay and introduce them to the Lime Bay fishermen and just say, right, have a chat guys and, and look at the benefits of fishing sustainably and see what those fishermen are doing, how they're catching their fish stocks. Fantastic. Um, there's so many more questions I can ask, but um, I'm looking at the clock and I think um, what we will do is I will send these over to you, Ian and Sarah, and then uh, we can we can get some answers and we'll share them on the Trust website. So thank you ever so much for such a fantastic talk. Right, I'm going to share my screen now if this all goes to plan. Excellent. So we have a few more talks coming up in March, um, as you can see here, and we're also booking for the ones in April as well. Um, coming up on the 6th of April, uh, this one is for um, Sussex Wildlife Trust members and friends of Rye Harbour only. Barry Yates will be talking about spring at Rye Harbour. Then on the 13th of April, Michael Blenko and the team will be back um, talking about all the sightings, uh, sounds of spring, hopefully some bee, bee flies and some uh, orange tip butterflies in there. And then you can join us on the 15th of April where Claire Blenko, the manager of the Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre, will be um, giving us insight into wildlife recording and how important that is for our conservation work. And then finally, uh, Mike Russell will be doing his introduction into birdsong. Uh, 
this talk's already very popular. So if you want to come along to this, I suggest you book your place pretty quickly. And uh, of course, we've been in partnership with the Sussex Ornithological Society, and we've got a couple of very interesting talks coming up with them about rare breeding birds and lockdown birding in Afghanistan, which sounds like something not to miss. If you've enjoyed the talk this evening, it would be brilliant if you could make a donation to support our work, or even better, join the Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, at the end of this talk, you'll be redirected to a page um, which will include links to Help Our Kelp. It will um, also have the video narrated by David Attenborough for you to watch there, and a chance to sign up for the Help Our Kelp e-newsletter, which will is the best way to keep updated with the project. So just leaves me to say thanks again to Ian and Sarah for giving a big round of applause there. And we hope you've all enjoyed that talk. Thank you very much.